When we think back to God's chosen people of the past, the Israelites, our first thought is probably how faithful they were. But then when we actually start reading the books of the Old Testament, we realize how often they were unfaithful to the Lord. Whenever there was difficulties, whenever there was problems, they would eventually turn away from the Lord. And in the first reading today, the Lord kind of gives them an ultimatum. Decide today who you are going to follow. You're going to follow the false pagan gods of this world? Are you going to follow the false gods of your ancestors? Or are you going to follow me, the God of heaven and earth? Now, before the people are able to respond and give their answer, we see that Joshua steps forward and says, For me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua doesn't wait to see how other people are going to respond to the Lord. He is already committed. He has that personal relationship with the Lord. And so he's not going to let the actions or lack of actions of others determine his own commitment to God. Do we allow the actions or the lack of actions of others to determine whether we are going to serve the Lord or not? For five weeks, five weeks, we have been listening to the sixth chapter of John. And throughout this chapter, the Lord has said that he is the bread of life. That his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink. And several times he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. It just seems that just using logic, one can conclude that if Jesus says something over and over and over again, it must be important. It must be significant. Even to the point that Jesus is willing to stake his entire ministry on this one singular point. The Eucharist. But when Jesus speaks about his being present to them in food, they're scandalized. Remember we heard last week, the response was, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? But Jesus doesn't back down. He doesn't water what he says. He actually doubles down. He becomes more graphic in the description of what he actually means. Now, sadly, this is often lost to us because of the translation into English. Because all we hear is eat, 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 eat. But we don't realize that when Jesus talks, he uses two different words in Greek to describe this. The first time when he's talking, he uses the word eat that most of us, I think, are familiar with. To consume something, right? But when he gets challenged and responds back to that challenge, he uses a word for eat that actually means to chew or to gnaw. And so what he says to them is, unless you chew or gnaw on my flesh, you will not have life within you. Jesus, they know that Jesus is not speaking symbolically or using a metaphor. They know exactly what he is saying and disgusts them. It scandalizes them, which then leads to them what they say today is, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? And I agree, that saying is hard. That Christ gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist for us to consume, to us to chew and gnaw on, 
Yeah, that is hard. But there's all many teachings that Christ gives us that are just as hard and difficult. But who believes this? Who can accept this? Those who have come to believe and are convinced that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Because if we look at Jesus' teachings as simply mere opinions, merely symbolic language, then Jesus truly really isn't God. He's a fake. He's a liar. And therefore, none of his teachings actually mean something. And that's the response of those disciples in today's gospel. They walk away from Jesus because they don't believe that Jesus is God. You know, it's interesting, worth noting, that when you go home today or tomorrow and you open up chapter 6 of John, because I know you're all going to do that, right? And you're going to get to the point where it says, as a result of this, most of his disciples walked away and did not accompany him. And if you look at the verse number of when this takes place, it turns out to be verse 66 of chapter 6. 666, the mark of the devil. Because whenever one leaves, whenever one walks away from Christ, that is the will of the devil. So what good reason can we give as Christians to walk away from our Lord? I guess you don't have to answer that. I guess you can answer that to yourselves. But what good reason can we give to walk away from the Lord? What good reason can we give to walk away from the church that Christ himself established? Do we allow the hard teachings to lead us to turn away from the Lord? Teachings that might be contrary to our own personal beliefs or that of our culture? Do we allow the evil actions of others, including bishops and priests, to allow us to walk away from our Lord. God gave the Jewish people a choice in this reading of what they're going to do. And so I guess the question is, is what is going to allow us, what good reasons can we give? Because if we even allow the actions of others who do bad things to determine whether we are committed to the Lord, that is wrong. And two wrongs never make a right. Besides, if all the good people of the church walked away, who would we have left? Some bishops and priests? Certainly Jesus doesn't want that. But we have to decide, do we have that personal commitment to the Lord as Joshua determined in the first reading? Because we ultimately have two choices when it comes to our faith. We either deny that Christ is the Lord and walk away like most of those disciples did in the gospel, or we can respond like the apostles did, who said, To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and we are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. For me and my household, we will serve the Lord.